This podcast is being held in the lands of the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people. We wish to pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. This podcast is for mental health educational purposes only and should not be relied on as personal advice. Always seek the guidance of a health professional regarding your physical and or mental health. Opinions expressed are solely those of the individuals involved and may not reflect the views of the Mental Health Foundation Australia. This episode features a personal story of mental health. If you find yourself distressed, please reach out to Mental Health Foundation Australia's National Helpline at 1300 643 287 or Lifeline at 13 11 14. Everyone has their own unique story. Empowering Voices of Harmony welcomes all members of the community to have open and inclusive conversations surrounding their lived experiences. Season two will introduce individuals from a range of diverse backgrounds who have found harmony and community despite their struggles. Hear from our guests in their native languages to obtain a full grasp of the difficulties and strengths that it takes to become a truly empowered voice. We are here celebrating our first episode of the 2024 second season of the wonderful Empowering Voices of Harmony podcast. I might have to get my fireworks out. Fireworks! <laughs> here we go. Let's get things exciting, I guess. Um, exciting to be here and... Uh, this is not the start that I would imagine, you know, like uh, I wanted to have a more natural, uh, this is a very, I might say to the, the ladies and gentlemen of the internet who are listening to this, that this is a very unplanned <laughs> podcast and we are just going to shoot the shit as they say. We're going to roll with it in a big way. <laughs> One minute into the podcast, I've already dropped the swear words, by the way. It happens. Goes to show my professionalism mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. But the aim, I think, Amanda, thank you for giving us the time to be here, by the way. We, we'd like to get to know each other, perhaps, during this 30 minutes of conversation mm-hmm. and a little bit about your background, about your stories, perhaps, and uh, how you have been, in, I mean, stories, you know, where does a story start, where does a story end, we have no idea, right? So, shall we start from the childhood, perhaps, Amanda Cops? Yeah, just briefly. Just briefly. We don't want to bang on too much about that, because it's kind of a bit boring, but we can go there. Ne- nothing with. is boring, Amanda Cops, because <laughs> you never know what I'm going to take from what you say, <laughs> and what I'm going to throw your way. Right, like, You know what I mean? Yeah. But I, I, I remember you telling me once that, uh, I think it was your great-great-grandparents, the first uh, who arrived in um, Australia mm. with, uh, with the, sort of with the first wave of people who came here. Mm. Uh, and you told me a story about how um, it was a petty crime that they committed, I think, right? And then... Oh, vaguely, yeah. yeah. No, it, was, it wasn't a petty crime so much. It was uh, the Italian side of my family uh, eloped and ran away to New Zealand. Loped, was that? Loped. So they were supposed to get married formally and the family wouldn't let them. The family said, no, wow. you can't get married. Wow. And so they racked off and, and moved to New Zealand and then ultimately ended up in Australia. So just to say to the family of their own that, look, we are going to get married because we love each other or whatever. Yeah. They were like, yeah. why, why they were against that? That's very odd. Um, I think at the time uh, it was a socioeconomic issue as in like one of them came from a wealthier family than the other yeah. and they just didn't think that they were an appropriate match. That is bothersome, isn't it? Like, standard though for the time. Standard for the time. Even today maybe, uh, perhaps. Uh, I, I can imagine if I'm... 50 years old and I have a wife and then even still then my parents would be like you know trying to stick their nose into uh, my life Mm. which would be like look I'm 50 years old at this point leave me alone (laughs) but um, interesting and then so you say your Italian side of family what about the other half what was that mad Irish people (laughs) pretty sure most of them are criminals (laughs) Bookmakers, at least. <laughs> Petty crime. Always up to mischief. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, and, and my dad was like, you know, the ultimate trickster talker. Really? You know? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so I, I get a bit of it from because yeah, he had all the skill set. For sure. Yeah. Any magic tricks that he would do or just, no, just general, general tricksters? Just, just probably just stealing tricks. A little and, bit of a hell raiser. And, and, yeah, and pretending to be something he wasn't to get further advanced in life. And, mm, you know, it's mm, quite, mm. quite interesting. That is a skill, though, isn't it? That's though? an acquired skill for sure. Yeah. And it's learned. And yeah. you, can, you can pick up 
you know, from, from your environment what you can get away with and what you can't. Right, so it's right. Interesting. It's like my life. It's very similar to what I get up to. So, so would you say in the household that you were brought up, mm-hmm. how was the dynamic of the family? Was it, would you say, more Irish perhaps or more Italian? So. or no, more Irish. And that's fun. That's that's. Yeah. I, I used to live with the Irish family, and she would cook the most wonderful apple pies and scones mm. and stuff. Mm. And her husband used to sit at the background and drink beer and watch the football and burp very often. <laughs> and Sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> and she would always apologize to me. I'm like, I'm sorry about my husband. I'm like, that's fine. You know, I'm just enjoying myself. Um, but we don't want to talk about perhaps a lot of about my life but I, it will pop up at some of point course. so I would imagine so interesting so Irish family were raised here uh, yeah, in, weird in, in Melbourne yeah in Melbourne had a, a normal kind of uh, kind of you know squarish upbringing nothing too adventurous yeah I always had like a sense of I was always like the one that you know I was always the one that caused the scene I was always the one that would stomp my feet <laughs> always the one that had the uh, incessant um, thirst for justice Thirst for justice. Always. It was always right and wrong. So it was always black and white. Wow. And it wasn't until I got diagnosed with bipolar disorder that I realized that mm. that actually kind of was one of the aspects that faded away. Oh, wow. I used to look at people and their situations in life and go, oh, well, this is where you're at. You know, this is because of all of your choosing. And, you know, this is just how it is, black and white. You know, there's mm. no shades of gray or all, all in that. And then I got diagnosed with bipolar and it just kind of set me on a different sort of pathway. And now... Every time I look at someone, no matter who they are in life, I just think to myself, what's your story? Mm, mm. Oh, it's always a story. Everyone always has a story. Absolutely. Good, bad, or indifferent. Everyone, everyone has a story. And yeah. I just think it depends on your maturity and where you are in life to, do, to decide that you're willing to actually acknowledge that story and, and move forward with it or, or use it for good or, you know, or just plant it over there in the corner. And, you know, yeah. It sounds like you have a mission here almost, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of like... Um, it's kind of like sometimes in life you get told Mm. you don't have a say you you get told it is Mm. what it is you get Mm. told things are supposed to happen and they go along and there are people in your life that influence you or Mm. or want you know want for better or worse for you Mm. Uh, and I think that's probably what's shaped me more than anything in the last five or so years but it's like you know you live your childhood and you go through your teenage years and all those things you know there's all those factors involved. So there's genetic factors, mm. uh, there's personality factors that you're, you're born with by nature, then mm. there's your environmental factors at play, and yes. that kind of shapes you to who you are by your mid-twenties. And then you mm. know, and mm. then as you learn and grow with others around you, that can also shape your life. But mm. your your parental factors, those guidances, are they, they as the years go on, they disappear. Mm-hmm. You know? And mm-hmm. so uh, I think for me, it, it all just kind of, you know... It, it is like a river, you know, you go along and you, you collect pieces of water as you go and you make little beaver dams. Um, <laughs> sometimes you get stuck by the bloody beaver dams and you have to get through and you've got to piss them off and go, right, okay, t- this is a blocker, what am I going to do? Yeah. You know, and yeah. then you get rid of that blocker yeah. and then you go to the next step and then you go, okay, shit, now what? You know, there's another blocker? Okay, right. And I think that the biggest blocker of my life was when I was diagnosed with bipolar and what happened up until that point for me to actually get there. What I'm curious about is what you said about um, how you used to have this thirst for justice that mm. was black and white. So at the early age, you had this ability, so to speak, to know what is right or wrong. Yeah. So where, is, where did that come from? Because I don't know. <laughs> that is fascinating, isn't it? I don't know. I was always the one that just thought things weren't fair or things needed to be more even or people mm. should share or... But I don't necessarily think that always applied to myself. <laughs> you had immunity by your own state. I was like, everything goes to me yeah. because I'm selfish by nature. <laughs> and then but everyone else should, you know, play fair. Play fair. That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> and uh, do you have any specific memory, perhaps, in the maybe the children playground or something like that? Where? Uh, oh, look. Yeah, there was always lots of things growing up where I was, you know, that's not right. Or, you know, mostly between relationships and dynamics between kids and class and whatever else and that kind of you know bitchy aspect that you have that sort of thing that used to really kind of get me get me riled up and I wasn't the most popular kid in school because of that how were you not the most popular kid in school because I was too rowdy and I challenged everybody right and it wasn't until I became an adult that that actually became a positive influence not a negative one wow yeah I was always just too mouthy mm. and that's just gone on forever now I'm too mouthy now but mm-hmm. um 
the people that are close to me value that mouthiness and they always say just don't get on bad Mandy's side because if you get on bad Mandy's side you're in a world of hurt it's always best to be on good Mandy's side and everything will be fine so is that a, a sort of the advice that your uh, parents gave you then and your people immediate surrounding of you no they gave me none of that that's purely how I was born wow so during school it must have been difficult then going through all of that huh it was but you know what I always had a close group of friends I always had friends because there were some people that realized that you know, sometimes there could be advantages to being friends with the one that stands up and is the mouthiest. We, I, and I say we because I share the sentiment here. I was an absolute troublemaker in school, jumping around. I, I like to even say I'm bullying people, but it wasn't like a hurtful type bullying. It was like creative in nature of how someone has a f name that rhymes with something, so I would mm. make fun of it in mm. a way. But it was never to hurt the person, yeah. you know? But I was always a troublemaker, mm. and uh, and and I think those people attract uh, because they got this energy about them, mm. right? Mm. So I, you know, completely uh, what do you call it? Resonate, re mm. resonate, or mm. relate yeah. to that, you know, in a sense. Um, did you have your own gang then, as a result? Oh, a little posse, <laughs> a little posse together, yeah. <laughs> Running around causing trouble. <laughs> oh, look, it was just basically a girl, a girl posse. Yeah. It wasn't really, definitely wasn't the Spice Girls. Let's put it that way. <laughs> we weren't all that hot, and we didn't, we couldn't dance for shit. But you know, yeah. we gave it a red hot go. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it is what it is. Look, they are a good bunch of girls, and I'm still friends with a couple of them now. That's awesome. Um, and yeah, and they appreciate me because they know that I just will just kind of lay into it. I don't, so, I don't, you know, I'm not going to hold back. I'll go, well, that's crap, and here's why. Mm. What, so those friends of yours uh, sort of have watched you grow as mm. from the teenage years until mm. now. Mm. Uh, personally, I think that's such a beautiful thing to have friends who mm. you know from lifetime. And because I've moved from so many com countries, uh, mm. uh, unfortunately, I left behind my friends. Mm, so I didn't, shame. yeah, I didn't yeah. grow with them, you know. Yeah. Um, did you... F f share the same uh, value like how's your relationship with your friends that now do, as they have grown uh, to watch you change from who you were and to where you are now that's a very very interesting question yeah. so basically what happened was is that one of my closest friends I met in primary school mm. and we had a period of time late teenage years where we didn't see each other just because of study and whatever else but then in the mid 20s we reconnected mm. uh, and another friend another two friends I went to high school with who we've been friends the whole way through. Mm. Uh, and another friend that I, we connected with through my husband's work, and I've been friends with her for over 20 years. Mm. So there's a bit of a, you know, a, you know, I've had friends for 30, you know, more than 30 years, the same friendship. Mm. And <clears throat> the interesting thing that they said, mm. that when I was unwell, mm. and they were like, what is going on mm. with this woman? <laughs> um, this is when you they, were hitting like the lows of the lows. Perhaps. No, I don't get low. No, you don't get low. No, no, I might get what my husband thinks I get some mild depression. Yeah. I think it's situational more than anything else. If something bad happens, then I get a bit depressed. Right. But by nature, I don't have um, a drop down in my bipolar. Okay. I, I stay like at level one and then I'll kick up. Right, right. Which is where the energy comes from. But we'll, we'll get to that later. <laughs> sure. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and they all said, oh, look, that's how you used to be when you were like 18. Today they tell you this. Yeah, well, no, not now so much, but when I was unwell and I was quite manic, I was uh. quite manic as well. And they would say, yeah, you know, and the thing was is that um, my behavior, I was displaying some very weird behavior and, and my friends just didn't know what to do. Mm. And they, were conf they were very confused and it was a very confusing time for everyone because uh, I'd had some, you know, some traumas and some people, had, my parents had passed away a very short period of time and um, my husband had, had a heart attack. So this was in my early 40s, wow. and so I got a little bit silly, and it turned out that um, I got a little bit silly because I kind of blew a brain fuse, <laughs> and I got diagnosed with bipolar. Who it took wouldn't? a year yeah. to be diagnosed, right, right, right. Um, and so I would just became a different person. Who, like, that, that is, I don't care who it is, even the strongest, iron-hearted, minded person, mm -hmm. you know, th th those events in lifetime for anyone. Like my grandpa, uh, grandmother passed away like a year or so ago, and I didn't really know her because I live outside of the country. Yeah. Yeah. But just watching my family go through that, mm. the siblings uh, of my mother, there's two of them, mm. and 
I felt like I had to do something in that moment. Mm. Like, and I, I remember calling them and I'd be like, let's celebrate the memories of my our grandmother mm. or your mother in all of the glorious good memories of it mm. and just keep that alive, you know? Like, mm. But th- they were devastated. So, you know, you say your brain cells were exploding, mm. you know? It's you, all about stages of grief. Everyone grieves grief, at yeah. different levels and different time frames, and yeah. there is no set time for grief. Yeah. Um, and so I didn't really get time to grieve because I was too busy being hypermanic. I was too busy going out buying a sports car and spending three thousand dollars at the Nike shop. I now have about thirty pairs of sneakers. Um, they're all great. I love them. Um, <laughs> yeah, there were some things that I did that were quite um, out of character at that time. Lost over thirty kilos in a very short period of time. Exercised like it was no one's business. Fourteen k's a day. Um, I became someone else. It was very weird. And, you know, my friends were like, what do we do with her? <laughs> and, um, and and a lot of people just thought, some family and friends just thought, oh, she's doing really well. Um, you know, my parents have passed away. She's living a, a, a good life. She just she's, bought a Lamborghini and three she's, pairs of sneakers. Yeah. You know? She's doing fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I wish lime green. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, sometimes they park it in the Claremont Street. I think there's a Giardo back there. So it's hot. Uh, what's it? Uh, Giardo, a Lamborghini. Oh, yeah, yeah. Galazzo, yes. So, um, yeah, I want one of those. That's great. Yeah. Um, that's one of the remnants of being hypermanic is I, now I'm on, I want all these cars. But it, it's kind of like, yeah, you can't pick and choose. You know, you can't ne- pick and choose your symptoms of what you get and what you, what you don't end up with. Ne- you know? Next thing you know, Amanda Cops is an F1 driver yeah, challenging the seat go. for Carlos Sainz. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I'm not going to go against Sainz. You know, he needs his drive. He's, he's a lovely young man. It's not going to happen. Fantastic. Fantastic. So, yeah. So, yeah, it was an interesting time of my life. Mm. And then, you know, unfortunately, um, but fortunately, I was actually uh, hospitalized. So I was in, spent some time in a psychiatric unit at mm. Mitchum Private, an amazing place. Uh, came out nearly a month later. Mm. Um, and uh, my good time was over. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was on some decent medication. And, yeah, they managed to kind of uh, push the hypomania down. And I was pretty stable. Um, might I say, like, I think I just learned something new here because, you know, I'm not educated into uh, mental health stuff at all. Mm. Uh, so when you describe hypermania and the different types of behavior that uh, uh, sort of arise from it, uh, I never imagined uh, this uh, that you would go like on a shopping spree or yeah. this and that. Could you expand a little bit on like what personally you had or what other people with bipolar perhaps so as a general rule people who yeah. get hypomania yeah. um and go all the way up to mania mania is where you lose control and you're not able to um actually acknowledge what you're doing you might you know get to the point where you're psychotic so you're not aware of your surroundings and your uh you know you you can have very bad symptoms you know be very scared and you know attack you know lash out those sorts of things um i touched on that briefly but I was managed to get intervention in time so that didn't become a real issue for me mm-hmm. um, but your hypermania can exist and show itself in many many ways so it's basically just like everyday behavior that you would live but heightened Heightened. so on a grander scale on a faster scale because your brain when you're hypermanic is moving so fast isn't it fascinating how the brain chemistry like the slightest changes can activate this kind of uh, mm. stuff you know and the scientists have really no idea what's going on they, they haven't figured anything with the brain have they i take lithium and i don't know how lithium actually works lithium the one that goes in the batteries no <laughs> <laughs> not that lithium it's the same base element but it's yeah. not processed the same oh, is it? Okay. it's safe for people to eat it's actually digested as a salt that's okay. So, yeah, so you'd you put it on your food or water or something. No, like. you actually take it as a tablet. <laughs> <laughs> but the side note, lithium actually makes you really thirsty. So You're it right. makes you thirsty because it's a salt, but then mm. you also crave salt. So it's a bit of a weird combination taking lithium. But right. it's a very effective medication. It works really well for me. It's not for everyone, of course. Right. But, right. Um, right. you know, right. seek your treating professional's advice. Mm. But, yeah, it's really helped me and it's made me a lot more grounded in my life, which is why I can work at the Mental Health Foundation Australia uh, because, yeah, I'm able to kind of be you know be stable enough without that medication i'd be jumping off the roof <laughs> flying don't encourage like that, by the way don't yeah. encourage it yes. but yeah i i yeah i did have moments when i was unwell where i was um displaying unusual behaviors and was going on levels of misadventure 
So now that you are the president of uh, Bipolar Victoria and uh, you work here full time, I think, right? At mental. No, Bipolar. I work here three days a week, but um, I, yeah, I work for Bipolar Life and I'm the president of that organization and I also run uh, all the support groups as all well. The in conjunction, because we're an amalgamated organization with Mental Health Foundation Australia, mm -hmm. where I also work. Yeah. And then the whole program that I run, besides being president of Bipolar Life Victoria, yeah. it's 34 support groups per month currently. Fantastic, fantastic. But my question is, having that uh, established in your life, and then I also know that you have this scientific uh, approach mm. to things because you used to be a... Food scientist. Food scientist. Yeah, true. So where do we... Are, where are we going scientifically with mental health, bipolar in particular? And I'm trying to not sound stupid with this question. <laughs> At the same time, uh, where are we going and what contributions do you think as your experience running these support groups, do you think you've had some methodo methodology behind, like some, have you had some findings yourself where you're of like, of course, oh, please share. Of course, of course. Yeah. yeah the main findings you find is, uh, main findings you find, yeah. um, is the living experience is the number one thing that will drive the future for people with mental health issues. The and, living experience. And living experience. Okay. So there's lived experience and there's living experience. I like to refer to it as a living experience for me because I have a long term lifelong mental illness that I have to manage. I will never recover from. I will never be cured. Mm. It is a management issue. Mm. So that's why I'm living experience. So every day I get up and I'm living it. Mm. I'm living the, the highs and the lows. I'm living the awareness. I'm living the acceptance. Uh, you know, you know, you've got to do the hard yards. You've got to do the work every day. And the support group programs that I run, they all have very common threads to them. Mm. People's um, symptoms and how they deal with things might be different. But ultimately... Uh, they come to a meeting, no matter what their ailment is, for support, for belonging, understanding, um, and they just want to feel like they've been heard. I think what you're describing here is just natural life. I mean, life is uh, ups and downs, and yeah. the good, the bad, whatever. The, the ugly. The, the ugly. <laughs> you know, it's got all of it, and you. I don't think you can. Appreciate beauty if you don't know ugliness or appreciate happiness. If you oh, hundred percent. You know, so uh, what you described was life. Yeah, yeah. it is. But yeah. the thing is, is that unfortunately, when people are coming and they have a diagnosed mental illness, mm. um, you know, no matter what it is, mm. uh, you name it, we offer it. Mm. <laughs> <It's like laughs> There's too many labels. It's like, a, it's like a shopping list. You've got no <laughs> yeah. idea. Um, you know, at the end of the day, yeah. you know, the stigma out there is so real. Yeah, true. And so people just want to come, and you know, and so many people hide. Yeah. They hide what they have. They don't disclose. They keep it under a bush. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they pull it out when they have to, but otherwise, you know, and even they hide to friends and family. Then they're, they're not upfront and honest because mm. the stigma is real. The shame is real. They don't want to be out there telling people that they're not perfect. Yeah. But you know what? For me, I thrive in the imperfection of it. Yes. yes. I love it the most. I'm, yeah. I'm out there. I have it all over my social media. I don't care. And I don't care because, you know, it doesn't make me any less of a person. Absolutely. You know, I just get up every morning and I rock it. I go, the, yeah, you know what? This is what's on my backpack today. Don't care. You should be a motivational speaker, Amanda Cops. Oh, look. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could motivate a rock. To... <laughs> I, would, I would try. <laughs> <laughs> look, that's fantastic message. I think not just to anyone who suffers from mental illness, but just life in general, man. Mm. This is it. You've got to get on with it. Yeah. You, you're only, and, and for me, you know, Coming to the point where, you know, it, I was behaving in a risky manner and it could have been, it was close. It was very, very close to, you know, and my husband did say at one point, jokingly, but not jokingly, is that on your grave, it would say, it would say, died by misadventure. <laughs> so, and, and I'm all for it. What a way to go. <laughs> As I say, you know, she died doing what she loved. <laughs> she was parachuting while. <laughs> Just, you know, you, people who are not in touch of their own reality, uh, when they're that unwell, unfortunately, do stupid things. Like, um, it appears that people with bipolar disorder really like to go out to sea. Really? That's a common one. Interesting. They have an affinity with the water. That's fantastic. Um, That's where all life comes from, right? Yeah, it's very, and, and of course nature. So mm -hmm. people you know, with bipolar like to garden, they like to go on nature walks. They're really in touch with nature. When I was unwell, everything was beautiful. I yeah. have, on my phone, I have 
so many photos of flowers and scenery and whatever else just because it was just amazing and i still see beautiful things now but it's it's not the same it's not as vibrant and it doesn't come out at you and it doesn't when, when you're unwell you know it, that's the result that you get you get all everything is as i said everything is blown up right so everything you see is just beautiful and blown up more than it really is in life but is it? But do, then, don't you wonder, like, if I can uh, tweak the medication a bit lower so I can? Don't don't do this, by the way, people. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, we do not advise this, please. This, this section is... of the podcast has a disclaimer. <laughs> um, of course, people want to manipulate their medication all the time, and this is why you know people get say you know uh, they class as medication uh, non-compliant is the terminology that's used. You're not compliant in regards to your medication use. Mm. Um, and this is because people crave that high. It is no different to a drug addiction. I can imagine so. It's a dopamine and serotonin hit. Wow. Back and forth, back and forth. That's what hypermania and mania is. Wow. wow. So it's the brain, you know, playing tricks mm -hmm. and the neurons are spinning fast mm -hmm. and, you know, you want that high. You said two things that I want to touch on. One was the stigma around it, which mm -hmm. I th believe as, as a Persian background, I can okay. clearly see that in countries that are not even giving support yes. to this kind of stuff and hide it under the rug, oh, don't we'll be embarrassed and Some stuff. countries don't even have a word for it. I can imagine Farsi. I don't know Farsi that well, but can you? which country doesn't have a word well, in for it? In some of the Asian um, cultures, there's no such word for mental illness or different types of mental illness. It's madness. not discussed. Madness, madness, madness. Yeah. So that's the one. And then the other one was, uh, I want to speak about, uh, this could be sensitive, I suppose, but how does one establish a trusting relationship with a psycho uh, analyst and a psychotherapist because you know like I was uh, diagnosed with ADHD years ago mm -hmm. and then I did not trust this person who was giving me the medication six years I was on it mm -hmm. felt like a robot mm -hmm. and then I came to Australia and I go to a different mm -hmm. uh, psychiatrist and she told me, oh, you're fine, you don't have ADHD. Huh. And, and, and it's the wording as well. It's like, have this or have that. This, the, the diagnosis, the label, the, the, label the tag. Is you might wear a dog tag around your neck. Yeah, it's like, I've got this disease by, mm. you know, something. Which is why I like to refer it to as I, I have bipolar disorder. Many people say, I am bipolar. That's mm. just bullshit. You're, <laughs> not, you're not that. You're a bunch of ten other things before you say at the end, oh, also I happen to have bipolar disorder. Yeah. It's not a case of, it's not the full label of who I am. It's... Yeah. Yeah. It actually helps shape me as a person. One hundred percent, it does. Mm. But um, mm. it's, it's not all of me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you know? no. There's so much to a person, right? Yeah. So how, how, how do you have to be able to trust the Course. person though? Right? And this is where the awareness and the acceptance comes into play about your diagnosis. Right. This is where the important stuff hits. Mm. Because you can go from psychiatrist to psychiatrist to psychiatrist and spend truckloads of money, mm. right? Because you're not trusting anyone. Mm. Sometimes you might get a bad psychiatrist. No one's perfect. Some psychiatrists out there are not brilliant. Mm. And then there are heaps of them that are really good and are, are there for your uh, quality outcome. Mm. But unfortunately, if you're not well enough to be able to sort through the clouds of your brain, mm. which is what happens when you're first diagnosed, and if your medication regime is not very good, mm. you are in a state of um, me, yeah, confusion me, yeah. and, and non-compliance and... And sometimes depression and uh, lack of uh, self-assurance to be trusting, to actually put that trust into a treating professional. Uh, yeah, you, it's a recipe for disaster. You are actually chasing good money after bad. And the paranoia is the main issue that people with bipolar uh, in particular mm. um, struggle with when it comes to treating professionals. They don't trust that they're going to be looked after. And it's such a shame because it's such a, a cycle of cycle of no success for want of a better word because you know at the end of the day you're unwell so you need a psychiatric care so you go to the psychiatrist you don't want to listen to what they tell you you're in denial you don't take the medication they give you and you're just back at the start again it's a, it's a, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy of sickness yeah. and it's really really sad but this the the work that you have to do as a person to gain the acceptance mm. will be then the tide that turns to get the professional help you will not take the professional's help seriously unless you do the work besides the medication. So this is a personal homework that you have to do? 100%. Yeah. Oh, yeah. massive amounts of work you have to do in order to be able to stand up and say, yes, I have bipolar, and yes, I'll go to a support group and I'll openly talk about it in a round with strangers. Mm -hmm. But it also happens, it's great, because by halfway through you go, oh shit, you realise that they're, they're the same as me. Mm -hmm. 
and we're all in the room and we're together and there's no one else in the world that gets it. Mm. We're all here in the round. So then you take that information, you take that reassurance, then you go home and you might get a decent night's sleep. And then you wake up the next day and you go, no, I really do need to go get some better help. Okay, I'll start taking those steps. I cannot imagine how a person who is in the darkest corners of his life or her life, mm. if without the support of a family member or friends or trusted one, just mm. need that extra push to go through this. And it's very, very hard for yeah. people who are isolated. And yeah. sometimes, unfortunately, they're isolated because their behaviours, mm. while they've been unwell, have pushed people away. Pushed and people. sometimes people get empathy fatigue. This is a whole problem in the system. Empathy fatigue is a empathy. massive issue. Right. It's because the parents and the family and the friends have tried and tried and tried. And through the patient not being, you know, the person affected not being well enough to actually have the, you know, the foresight to actually see what is necessary wow. and push everybody away. Wow, what a what we have reached a very sensitively very serious, now. <laughs> serious now, isn't it? Wow, that is um, upsetting, I think, in nature. Um, it's very frustrating for me. I can, you, because you care about the people who are see also... see people all the yeah. time, and I know their situations, yeah. and I just go, oh... What do we do? I can't make this right. This is a journey that they've got to work on their own. I can't fix this. I'm a bit of a fixer if you hadn't figured that out. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And I can't, I've had to let go and pull right back and say, okay, you can't fix everything. You can only fix what's in your immediate control. Then everything else, you can offer service, you can offer the support. You know, you, <laughs> you've got to let them come in their own time. Here's a fun question for you. Okay. What is the greatest gift you can give someone? Time. Lovely. That was the answer I was looking for. <laughs> and sometimes all you need to do is just give time to people for them to be able to express themselves. You know, you cannot uh, save everyone. You cannot help everyone. This is something I figured by myself where I was like, I'll just give you my ears for whatever hour yeah. I listen to you. Yeah. This is just uh, me be with my friends. Even, yeah. You yeah. Know? I had a phone call a couple of weeks ago from a, uh, a guy who wants to join a support group. Yeah. and he had a job before and by the end of it he was crying on the phone he was an older man yeah. and he said oh Amanda you know you've actually treated me like a human nice and I'm like well how else would I treat you <laughs> <laughs> and he started coming on his support groups yeah. and he gets on the support groups and he bangs on about me and I'm like alright now already time to move on <laughs> it's just like yeah okay I had a phone conversation with you and I gave you some good advice and you yeah. took it up and it's all great come along to the meetings smile and wave yeah. But for him, obviously, his institutionalization issues that he has had through government departments and whatever has led him to no positive outcome because no one treats him like a human. No one just says, hello, yeah, yeah. I'm here, what do you need? Yeah. I can give you this, mm. I can offer you that. How can we work around that? I mean, except raising awareness of this kind of stuff and getting rid of the stigmas, I think the conversations are important. Maybe this podcast will encourage people because the brave uh, nature of the people to seek help mm. when they're in the darkest corners of their, of mm. their lives mm. that is a, a sort of a fire within the person that is lit and it's just a small flame yeah. perhaps you yeah. know and yeah. you don't want that to die that's right how do we keep that alive you know and well how we keep it alive is pretty simple there you go on <laughs> so go on. <laughs> She's gonna solve the world's problems right now. Let's hear about it. Come on, woman. <laughs> it's the fact that when you're no longer at your lowest point, yeah. you don't put yourself first. When you're not in your lowest well, point. So when you're in your lowest so when you're not in your lowest point. So when you have had a level of recovery where you feel as though that you can give back because uh -huh. somebody gave to you, uh -huh. you give back. Wow. It's just energy, isn't it? We're yeah. passing through. It's always energy. And for me it's always just about if you're able Yeah. You give of yourself. I think I'm giving an advice here to myself is uh, pick a voluntary role at some, like mm -hmm. what, yeah. a day in a week to do something like that. Yeah. But it's not, it's an everyday life thing. It's yeah. like, um, okay, so I've been married for over 20 years, yeah. right? Good good times and bad, particularly when, you know, mental health is involved. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the best advice I got was from my husband's grandmother. And mm. she was through the war. Her husband went off um, to the Second World War. Wow. Um, you know, was a actually prized veteran, uh, coming up for Anzac Day, he was actually in the 39th Battalion at Kokoda. Wow. Um, so he is one of the, the heavy, heavy diggers. They've literally. seen some stuff. He saw some stuff and he came back and survived until he was 94 years of age. Bless him. Incredible. Um, she said, 
Always put the other person first. Always put the other person first. You should say that message in the airplanes because they say put the mask on the yourself, <laughs> yourself first. before the kid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That? It's true. But yeah, put yourself. Put, don't put yourself first. Put the other person first. So every time you make a decision that might affect someone else, put their feelings first. You'll never lose that way. I think in the Persian culture they have a saying that goes like, uh, "Guest is first, then is yep. God, and then is us." Yes. So we put the other person. Yep. Like, there you go. You know, that's I think. Yeah, they come, they get the best chicken. Say that again. <laughs> they come, they get the best chicken. Right. You know, I've got some family friends, and we go in the door, whatever. So, yeah. oh, don't forget, give them the best chicken. They give them you know, the best chicken because they're the yeah. guests. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Yeah, hundred so, percent. So the world needs to be kinder somehow. And you know, it just starts with everyday behaviour. But yeah. at the moment, there's not a lot of that going around. Right now, no. But do we have the capacity for it. It's just like, of course we do. What are we doing? Yeah. You know? And this is where the support groups have that offering. Right. Right. So for me, re-establishing the support groups after COVID, uh, it is... Gosh, COVID, I forgot about that. That must have been a difficult time for like the support groups and everything. Bipolars actually did really well during COVID. <laughs> did you? <laughs> Tell me The reason being, because they're always resilient by nature because they've got a lot of crap in their lives. Um, and they watch the world fall apart and everyone crying and they're just standing there going, oh yeah, welcome to my world. <laughs> that was the general consensus. That's we brilliant. had online groups, which was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but the fact that most people are used to isolation, it really didn't affect them that badly. Yeah. So they sprung out of COVID pretty quick. And, That's good. And we had good attendances at the meeting straight after, which was, which was damn fine because, yeah. you know, you, you, you want them to be able to continue on. The rest of the public were, you know, not yeah. doing so great, but the yeah. public were doing pretty well. That's For amazing. me, COVID was interesting because I was at home with my husband and my son, and COVID was a time where I shoveled shit. No. Literally. Go on. What I did <laughs> is I have a 27 meter driveway, it's four meters across. And it, during the height, it was a boiling hot summer. Oh. And I decided, because I was on medication, and I was still angry about being diagnosed and everything, and I was still trying to work through it all. And I had enough. So every day I went out, and I actually took about mm, five centimeters off my driveway. Because mm. it was actually like weeds and whatever else. So with a shovel, I'd just go out there in the boiling heat, and I'd wait to the middle of the day until I'd start just sweating. And I would just dig and dig and dig. And by the time I finished the driveway, A, it looked great. Uh, ready to be re Dirt, dirt road? Yeah, so my driveway was dirt. Uh -huh. like dirt, like rocks and whatever else, but it had lots of weeds and things growing through it, so I thought, you, nah. You must have been b b buffed yeah, up yeah, after yeah, that. Yeah. Muscles well, so everywhere. I was very thick back then, so I had lots of muscle. I still got a little bit left, but not much. That's fantastic. Um, and I just shoveled every day. Wow. And it, I, you know what? And it just, I, I got over it. Yeah. That was the turning point for me. Once I did that, I was on decent medication, and I had COVID to try and just, had a lot of thinking time. Mm. So... That's what you need to do. A lot of thinking time. Meditation. A lot of shoveling time. <laughs> just shoveled. And I remember standing in the middle of the driveway and it was like 40 degrees and my husband was like, get inside. I'm like, nope. And I'd just be shoveling and the sweat would just be dripping off me and I'd watch the sweat drop to the ground. You're right. I just, it was just, it was cathartic right. at that time. It had to happen. Right, right. And then by the time I was finished and COVID was over, I'm like, right, shit hot, let's go. Wow. And I was like, okay, what am I going to do? Because I'd been running the groups during COVID, which was fine. Mm. Um, I was, you know, doing those. But then I thought, I came out the other end and I'm like, rightio, well, uh, you've been told. Mm. So get it together, woman. Amazing stuff. What is one message we can give to people as a uniting factor of the world? Peace. How do we achieve world peace, Amanda Cops, in your opinion? Just put other people first. Just put all the, all the and, and every day, don't put days where you go, oh, I'm deciding I'm going to be selfish today and other days. You, it's not a situation where you can go, I'm going to be selfish all week and then on Saturday I'm going to go, I'm going to be nice. <laughs> it's like, nothing like that. It's just stupid. You can't be living like that. So it's just like every day you get up and you go, right, this is the things I've got to achieve for my day. Right, okay. Don't forget that the people you're going to be interacting with mm. need to know that they're important, need mm. to know that they're cared for and that you appreciate them. Mm. Mm. So, you know, do the work. Fantastic. I think this has been a wonderful conversation. It's been great. It's, it's a shame been... it has to end. Yeah. I. So I'm wondering if we are going to end it at this point. Because, I mean, we could speak more about your history or whatever. Bang, <laughs> but uh, do we want to... Uh, is there any, so, so what, any mission that you're particularly trying to achieve at the moment at Mental Health Foundation? Maybe perhaps more groups or is there any op closing message that you would like to end the podcast with? At the end of the day, I mean, I would love to say the sky's the limit, mm -hmm. but I can't because our budgetary constraints are a bit of a concern at the moment. So if anyone would like to donate to Mental Health Foundation Australia, we'd really appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, I the program we run is free. Mm, 
Mm. So, you know, and it's open to everyone. We run on equitable access. So it doesn't matter how, you know, whether you can need a carer to get in the door or need someone to help you run your Zoom program or whatever. We don't expect registrations. You can just come in and get, get the help and get the support that you need because at the end of the day, we offer the basics. It's, it's humanity. Yeah. That's yeah. what we offer. We offer the kindness. Yeah. And people just say, wow, it's free. And I'm like, yes, it's free. They ring and they think there's so many caveats attached to it and what do they want, you know, they're going to want half an arm mm. to turn up. And I'm like, no, this is not what we do. And they're so shocked and surprised when we offer it to them for free. And we offer it to them so easily with grace. We say, come in. There's no judgment here. You can just be you. Mm, mm. And, you know, that's probably why in 2024 we don't have the funding that we need because everyone's really selfish Simple. We have so much money that we spend on wars. Yep. And we could have put that money yep. into just yep. put down your guns, everyone. Let's yep. that be the general rule for every country in the yep. planet. Just stop it. <laughs> just put the gun down. Stop just killing each other. Just stop it. Doing we some don't tea. Need nukes. Just stop with the nukes. <laughs> no one is interested. What is that? Do you think it's like this? Uh, oh, if we don't have it, the other people are going to get. It's like the, it's, it's ridiculous. Paranoia. They're all paranoid. It's like five warmongers of the world. And it's, it's like you don't need to calm down. It's twen- 2024. There is no more fear of unknown and what they're doing. No. For God's sakes. There is. Put the, I know, but put yeah. the scientists together from all, all over the world. Let's focus on discovering uh, more of the space and the ground that we live on and celebrate this time together. I don't understand all this no. gun budget and uh, so and so. Get rid of it, man. It's a gun budget. Take it easy. I need a larger snack budget for my support group I know, program. Right? That's more important than yeah. the gun budget. Let's get some more candies and chocolates in here, <laughs> fellas. Feed everybody. <laughs> Feed everybody. Well, Amanda... It's been absolutely wonderful. Thank you. That was you. heaps of fun. That was good. Yeah, yeah it was I enjoyed good. that myself. Yeah, and uh, I suppose, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you also enjoyed and take something from it. And uh, visit our website at www.mhfa.org.au. Uh, that was the first time I said that. And with that, we leave you to have a good time and a good life. And uh, if you need to seek help, we are always here. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Amanda. Thank you. And uh, farewell, everyone. Thank you for listening to Empowering Voices of Harmony. Mental Health Foundation Australia is grateful to our guests for sharing their lived experiences, offering hope and a voice to others. The Mental Health Foundation Australia offers free mental health support groups on various topics, from anxiety, trauma, bipolar disorder, and many more. We also offer affordable counselling sessions at $20 per session at our Wellness Hub Psychology Clinic. Our podcast notes include helpful resources. We hope you found this episode informative. See you next time as we share more empowering voices of harmony.